Perhaps not surprisingly, we're going to talk about thankfulness today. And my, my goal is to cultivate in us uh, a spirit of thankfulness as we head towards that pretty significant holiday on Thursday. At least it's a, it's a big one in our house. I love Thanksgiving. Uh, it's right up there. It's not quite up there with Christmas, but it's like right below it in our house. In fact, it's one of the reasons we don't listen to Christmas music before Thanksgiving. Not knocking you if you do. Totally cool. We do not in part because we want to spend November thinking about all the amazing things that we have and just having that gratitude and, and thankfulness. And so we head into Thursday with all of that. What I want to do today is do a number of things and exercises and things to get you thinking to kind of cultivate in you that spirit and appreciation of thankfulness. And so what I want to do first is I want you guys to picture your absolute best Thanksgiving. Okay, not just your, your favorite part, but think back over the years, your absolute favorite Thanksgiving. And if you need to close your eyes and do this, great. If not, great. I want you to picture who was there. I want you to picture maybe who, who wasn't there. I want you to picture what you ate. Maybe what you ate too much of. Maybe, maybe picture what you made for someone else to eat. Picture where you were. Picture what you did. And I want you to hone in on that feeling that you had on that best Thanksgiving. And I want you to hold on to that. It's that feeling. It's that idea of thankfulness and appreciation for what we have that we get to celebrate on Thursday. Now, when I look back, I thought back, I thought about this stuff. <laughs> Chex, any other Chex Mix fans in the house? Thank God I'm not alone. All right. So I'm a pretty huge fan, and I was blessed with an aunt that makes the best Chex Mix on earth. Now, I'm not knocking yours. Might be great. But for me growing up, when Aunt Janice showed up with the Chex Mix, I ate this stuff over and over and over until I couldn't eat anything else. And then I had Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> right? Like, this was Thanksgiving for me as a kid. Like, I got so excited about this stuff and eating as much of it as I could. And then, thank God, I grew up. Right? And I grew up. And now, my Thanksgiving memories, the ones that I remember the most, the things that are the best for me, involve this. Now, you might be looking at the turkey and thinking, oh, great, Hinchy's matured a ton. He used to stuff himself with Chex Mix. Now he's moving on to stuff himself with turkey, and that's actually not the case. My favorite part of Thanksgiving now is making one of these. Eating it's okay, but my favorite part is actually the night before, preparing it, getting up early in the morning on Thanksgiving when no one else is up, and stuffing this beauty in the oven. I like it the old-fashioned way. I know there's other ways. I'm not knocking. It's totally cool. Do your thing. But I like the old-fashioned way in the oven. And you put it in there in the morning. And then you just smell goodness. Like all day long. And then at some point, right, when it's done, whenever it's done, you pull it out and you cut it up and you give it to people and you look at the look on their faces. That's my best Thanksgiving. Thank God I grew up and came to a deeper understanding of what Thanksgiving is. It's about the giving of thanks for what we have and sharing that with other people and the feeling that we cultivate inside of us as we do that. Now, as I was preparing for today, you guys know I'm a word nerd, so I looked up the word thankful and the word grateful because I want to see what, what do we say today that this means. And the word thankful, at least according to Merriam-Webster, means this, conscious of benefit received. So just in other words, that you know that you've been blessed by something. Whereas grateful, again, according to Merriam-Webster, says you're appreciative of benefits received. You know, so there's a difference there, right? I don't know if I agree with that. I didn't write the dictionary. No one asked me. But for me, when I think about Thanksgiving and thankfulness, it is only about that appreciation. It's not just about knowing that you're blessed. It's about really appreciating what you have. And I want to take a minute since we got Thanksgiving on Thursday to give you an example of what it looks like and thank you guys, the church. And so what I want to ask you to do, if you're willing to do this, is if all year, in all of 2019, if you have given just one hour of service to this church, will you please stand up? Please. And I know you don't do it for that. Would you please? 
Please, yes, absolutely you, yes. Thank you so much for what you do. This, we literally, church, we could not do this stuff with you. All of this, all the things we do, all that we're going to do, it is you that do this. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's on behalf of, of the church. We're going to look at a passage today that I like to call the Thankful Samaritan. There's, there's different titles for this story. I like to think of it this way because I like to think about this one of the ten who came back to Jesus and was very thankful and how he was described by Jesus and I think used by Jesus to remind us of something we should all be doing. So let's take a look at the Thankful Samaritan starting with Luke 17, 11 to 13. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. I want you to notice how they're approaching Jesus even. Their respect, their humility, they don't rush up to him. They don't grab the, the hem of his garment, right? They literally keep a distance from them. They respect him as Lord and Master. They are humble. They are not worthy. And that is exactly how we should come to Jesus. And I think that attitude, I think that posture helps pave the way for this one who's going to come back to Jesus. Because humble helps us come to him. Humility helps us come to the Lord. And humility, I think, helps us be very grateful now contrast that with pride. Pride gets in the way of thankfulness. If we think, and we are all susceptible to this, if we think that we deserve all of it, what do we have to be grateful for? If we think we have everything, what do we have to be grateful for? But these 10... They know they're unworthy, and they approach Jesus in that way. Now, to kind of remind us, since we're not in their exact situation, I want to kind of give us some perspective on all that we have, and the reminder, the reality, that every single one of us, we start out with nothing. Like, literally, you want a memory to remember? Go back to the very beginning. Right? When you showed up in this world, you had nothing. And then what happened? You were loved, held, cared for, given, 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 fed, cleaned up, cared for, given, given, given. Your whole life, my whole life, has been other people, whether it's family or, or friends or loved ones, literally clothing us, feeding us, teaching us, getting to where we are. We start with nothing, folks. And so on this Thanksgiving, we at least have that to be thankful for. Now I want you to picture one more thing. I want you to reflect on a time that you got something you needed. Not something you wanted. This is not that cool thing that was on your Christmas list when you were five that you got. Not that thing. Something you got, something you absolutely and totally needed. So, so go to a place that maybe you were super thirsty. For whatever reason, you had had some drink in a long, long time and then someone walked up and said, here, here's something to drink. Or maybe, maybe you were really hungry. You hadn't eaten something in a long time for whatever reason, and someone said, here, have some of this. Or maybe you just, you had a ton on your plate, you had a ton to do, you were running 110%, and someone walked up to you and said, can I help? Can I take that for you? That feeling that you had back then, that thankfulness, that is good for us, folks. That is part of who we are. I love this quote from Diana Butler Bass. Being thankful is the very essence of what it means to be alive. Being thankful is the very essence of what it means to be alive. To be really living is to be thankful for the fact that we showed up with absolutely nothing. And we have been blessed ever since. You will notice in your bulletin, like I said, lots of different handouts today. This is one of them. Uh, I decided rather than give you guys the white one, I gave you these because you can see them from space, and you will not hopefully lose these easily, okay? I want you to use these this Thanksgiving, if you will indulge me, to cultivate that 
thankfulness. I'm going to share with you a story. It's really kind of a, like a fourth hand story that I learned when I was in seminary from a professor that heard someone speak about it. And that person who spoke about it learned about it in a book, actually, that they read. And the guy tells the story this way. He says, I was at a point in my life, I had never been lower. He was completely depressed. His marriage was a bust. And they did not know what to do. And he read somewhere about a very simple idea. And the idea was this. Take a three by five card, doesn't have to be super colorful, and then get a stack of them. Take that stack, put it on your dining room table. Every time you have dinner, every night, you and your wife pick up this card and write on it five things you're grateful for. Also write on it five ways you've seen God work in the world. So five things you're grateful for every day, every night, and five ways you've seen God work in the world. And not just you do it, your spouse do it. And then talk about it. And he said, you know, at first when I did it, it was a little awkward. It was a little different. It was a little weird. It started really basic. Like, it started with things like, I'm grateful for the clothes I have on. And I'm grateful that I can breathe. Like real basic stuff. And then all of a sudden, he noticed over time that he started to fill this out faster and faster. And he started to get more excited, recognizing that, wow, he actually had a lot to be thankful for. And then remember, his wife is doing it too. So now they're talking about these things that they have, that they're seeing the way God works in the world. And guess what happened to them? It's not shocking. Mood improves. Relationship improves. Attitudes improve. Not because they got anything more, but simply because they remember what they already had. And we're thankful for that. So I give you this to encourage you. If you want to do this around Thanksgiving table or at any point in time, just, just write on here. Five things. Maybe just fill the card up. Both sides. Other side's not even lined. All this stuff that you have to be grateful for. It is so good for us to have this attitude of thanksgiving. Note these, uh, these ten, when they came up to Jesus, they had a little bit of distance, right, between them and, and Jesus because they really respected him. And I think that respect really aids thanksgiving. Now, when I say this for us, I'm not saying keep your distance from God. In fact, that's not what he wants, right? He wants us close to him. He wants us to abide in him, to abide with him. What I mean by respect in terms of our relationship with God is that we respect that he is in charge and we're not. That the Lord is greater than you. That literally everything you have that you write on this card, everything that we have in these boxes that we're going to send out, it came from him. That respect for him will actually help our attitude of thankfulness as we head into Thursday in this celebration. Verse 14, when he saw them, when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. So verses like this are why I am confident Jesus is the coolest person to ever walk the face of the earth. There's no magic wand there's no hocus pocus, there's no flashy lights, there's no weird spells or incantations. He just says, go and show yourself to the priest. And just as they did that, as they were obedient, they're healed and clean. No show. He just took care of it in an incredibly powerful and simple way. Now what's the deal with the priests? Right? He doesn't say to them, you are healed. He just says, go show yourself to the priest. Why would he say, go show the priest? There's actually a couple really powerful reasons he does this. And the first is, you've got to know that back then, the priests were the ones who signed off on you being either sick or healthy. So they didn't have their understanding. The understanding we have today, right, about medicine and all the physicians we have. They couldn't email their doctors, right? And so back then, if they wanted to know if they were well or not, the priest would say, yes, you are healed, and no, you are not. And so Jesus says, you should go see the priests, knowing full well that by the time they got there, he's going to give them a, a clean bill of health. Now, the other reason this is important, and if you want another example, take a look at Luke 
The priests, when they got, when the lepers got to them and were no longer lepers, the priests would have to hear who did it. So you're telling me that you were a certain way, had a certain condition, and now it's gone? How'd that happen? No, no, no pill, no surgery, no procedure? Well, there's this guy, this Jesus guy. It's a powerful witness that Jesus is sending off, and he knows full well that when they get there, they're going to be A-OK. -okay. So as they went, this happened in 15 to 16, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. So after this happens and they take off, one of them says, hey, wait a second. It's a little different. And then decides he's going to do something about it. And he turns back for Thanksgiving. He stops. He pauses. He interrupts where he's going to say, wait a second. I think I owe this guy. And then God for what's happened to me. Because sometimes we've got to go out of our way to thank God and other people. Sometimes we literally do. We have to pause and stop in our busy lives and say, I got to thank God for this. I got to turn back and thank so and so for this. And sometimes it looks like the old fashioned way. Sometimes it takes a, a physical card, a handwritten note. I remember when I was a, I was a kid, we used to sometimes write these, these notes, my cards from my dad, and, and he would look at us and he'd say, look, you, you don't need to buy cards. Like, just take out a piece of paper and just, just give me one of those. And I remember at the time I didn't quite get it. I wasn't sure if he just didn't want us to spend, like, his money on cards. But now that I'm older and I get cards from my kids, I'm like, yeah, I get it. There's something about that handwritten piece there's something about today, if you've ever received or, or, or sent a, a thank you card. Because, yeah, it, it's easy, right, to go to pick up our phones. We can text a thank you, and that's good. And we can send a message of a thank you. We can send an email of a thank you, and that's good. It's better than nothing. But, man, when you go to all the work to buy the card, pull out one of those archaic pens to write in the card, go get the envelope, put it in the envelope, seal the envelope, Find someone's address, write it on the card, put the return address, then put a stamp on it, then go all the way to the mailbox? Something happens. Something happens in us as we do it, and something definitely happens for the recipient. When we pause and we turn back and we say, I'm going to be thankful. Something happens to us and something happens to them, and I think something happens between us and God when we do that with him. And notice, it's not quiet. Thanksgiving is actually supposed to be loud. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the volume around your table on Thursday. Okay? What I'm talking about is as we give thanks to God, this is not a quiet thing. Say it, sing it with everything you got. It is not meant to be a quiet thing. This, this, this one who comes back, he is loudly, loudly praising God. He is not shy about giving glory and credit to God. And I love the picture of where he is. I want you to picture this. Picture this guy who's literally, he's on his knees at the feet of Jesus Christ, but praising God. He knows, this guy knows quite a bit. It's not just about this one that he sees. It's about the Father, this God up above who's healed him. And so he's at the feet of Jesus Christ, but praising God. Shouldn't we all be there? Like literally just praising God for who he is and what he's done for us all year long. As rough as some of our years has been. And I know for some of us 2019 has been rough. But I would guess there's still some stuff we could write on this list. Get on our knees at the feet of Christ. At the feet of the one who went to that cross for you and I. And say God thank you so much for everything you've given us. And note how the guy got there. He fell. Like he fell. At Jesus' feet. Usually in the Bible, when in, this, in, the, in the New Testament, in the Greek, when it says that they prostrated themselves, the word is proskuneo. That's what worship is. It's literally laying yourself down. That's not this word. This word is literally fell. 
Like he was so grateful, he fell down unworthy at the feet of Jesus Christ. When's the last time we did that? Just messed up our pants and our knees and just grateful. At Jesus' feet, praising God. And he's described as a Samaritan. This one was a Samaritan, which for all these folks, he means he's an outsider. He's someone that they don't appreciate. And what's he doing? Appreciating. Leave it to the outsider to not fit in for all the right reasons. 17 to 18, then Jesus asked, were not 10 made clean? But the other nine... Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Don't you love Jesus with his questions? God with his questions? Yes, three of them. Uh, wait a minute, weren't there ten of you? Where'd the other nine go? Because I'm pretty sure I healed all of you. And was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? You ever thought about where were the other nine? Like, seriously, where were they? This whole exchange is not a long exchange between Jesus and this one, right? Like, seriously, he's, he's praising very loudly. How far away could they have gotten? I don't know exactly where they were, but I like to picture something like this. That they actually probably weren't terribly far away. They probably could hear the one who was loudly praising God at the feet of Jesus. But they had taken off, and they were so happy about the fact that they were healed, and that's good for good reason. This is an amazing thing for all ten of them. But they've gotten so excited about what they've been given, they forgot to turn around and say thank you to the one who just did it for them. For us, please, don't be so happy with what you've been given, you forget the giver. I think every single one of us are susceptible to this. Especially today when things happen and come to us so quickly. I mean, within seconds, we can have access to new things. Within days, things can pop up at our house. And we don't stop and say, wow, you know, this is a gift from someone. And we've got to stop and pause and go back and say thank you to God, the one who has given us. I was really blessed. I grew up in a house where my parents cultivated thankfulness. Christmas morning, uh, you know, there's different ways to do Christmas morning. And when we were kids, uh, we would all rush down and be all excited, right? Because there's gifts under the tree, and we just wanted to dive right in. But very young, like very young, my parents said, we are not going to just dive in and rip open, uh, rip off bows and take off the wrapping paper and just play with gifts all day. And what we would do is we literally would sit in different chairs, and we would give to each person, to my sisters and to my parents, the gifts that we were given, and we would set them by the chairs. Then we would take turns opening one gift at a time, one person at a time. And I waited so patiently <laughs> while this was happening. And what I learned over time is that that did something to us. And what happened over time is not only we opened one gift at a time, when we got the gift, we would go to the person who gave it to us, and we would say thank you. We would usually give them a hug. Sometimes we even play with it for a little while before we even got to the next person. And I remember as we got older, we got to this point where my dad literally said to us, he's like, you don't need to get up and give me a hug every time you get a gift. And I said, I know. You're right. I don't. We don't. But they had cultivated in us that thankfulness, that appreciation. It's something that we can all have over the stuff that we're given every single day. Now, there is a little bit of competition for this in the world. There is a, we're going to go with a characteristic, not a type of a person, a characteristic of people who sometimes can get a little bit spoiled. And when people, when I'm going to say it, we get spoiled, that makes thankfulness kind of hard. Look at this dictionary definition of spoiled. It says, of a person, I love this, especially a child, harmed in character by being treated too leniently 
or indulgently. Ouch. Harmed in character. For those who find themselves in position where they have just been treated too leniently by something or someone, or they've been too indulgent, they've had too much of something, it actually harms the character. And before we are so quick to point and say, so-and-so is spoiled, we need to remember that, folks, if we live here in this country, yeah, we're spoiled. If you were here yesterday, and you heard the, the director of HCO talk to us about what's going on in Haiti, we are spoiled. And according to the dictionary, that's a, a character issue. And it gets in the way of our thankfulness and gratitude. But the good news is, we really can push back on that by remembering that we literally started out with nothing. And look at all the stuff we have and just be grateful for that to God. When, when Jesus talked about this guy, he doesn't describe him as a Samaritan. He describes him as a foreigner. And that's not meant in any derogatory sense at all. It's actually a very physical and literal description. He describes him in the Greek as being out of country. And so what he's talking about with this guy is he says, this guy doesn't belong. And so leave it to the one guy who's doing what he's supposed to, right? The one grateful guy to not belong. And, and remember the percentage. Remember the odds here. This is 10%. This is one of 10 people that Jesus just healed. And so we got this one guy that doesn't belong, and Jesus says, yeah, he doesn't belong for all the right reasons. Now, I don't know what the, like, the national statistics are on gratitude. I don't know exactly how you would measure that. But I will tell you, generally in my experience, most of the people I interact with don't strike me as particularly thankful. I think actually Jesus is pretty close. And I think this is examples in the Bible for very good reason. I think we all could learn from this one, this 10% who does something that all 100% of us should be doing. Verse 19, then he said to him, then Jesus said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Which is yet another very cool and curious thing that Jesus says. He says, your faith has made you well. But uh, Jesus already healed him, right? Him and the other ten? What is this well? What is Jesus talking about? Is it possible that all of a sudden those other lepers that had wandered off and were dancing off had lost their wellness? I don't think so. It's not how Jesus operates. That's not how God operates. In fact, I'm pretty confident it's deeper than that when you look at the word that Jesus uses. The word he uses is sozo. And sozo is a very complicated and very powerful Greek word that means to save, preserve from harm, or rescue. Jesus looked at this guy and says, your faith has made you saved. You are preserved from harm. I have rescued you. It's no longer about the condition of his skin or his body. It's about the condition of his heart, of his mind. He says, you are well, something deeper happens once this man is grateful, once he's thankful. His faith gets deeper. And I say deeper because remember, all 10 of them had faith, right? All 10 of them called Jesus master. So they all, to a certain extent, had a certain amount of faith. But this one, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Something about his gratitude, his thankfulness, I would even say our gratitude and thankfulness will deepen our faith and draw us closer to the Lord. And the good news is, we had a whole holiday on Thursday to celebrate it, to remember it, and to go before the Lord and deepen our faith in that way. Jesus then says, get up and go on your way. Gratitude gets us going. The idea of remembering what we have has this, well, this way, I think, to kind of propel us in getting out and sharing all of that. Once we remember all the things that we are blessed with, it kind of gives us this excitement, this, this hope, this encouragement. Say, I'm going to go out and do something with this. Now, I want you to contrast this with what's going to happen in society this week. We go into Thanksgiving on Thursday, where we hopefully all remember and give thanks for what we have. Then what comes on Friday? Black Friday. Black Friday. 
Where we do what? Go get a whole bunch of other stuff. Think about this. And we're all being reminded of it with the ads and all of this stuff. What if, as Christians, we said, wait a minute. What if I use Black Friday to celebrate all that I have been given? What if I celebrate Black Friday or Cyber Monday or whatever to say, I'm going to go take one of those tags off that tree and give what I've got to someone else? I'm going to keep that Thanksgiving thing going. I'm going to keep this feeling in my heart going. I'm going to keep this closeness in who I am to the Lord going all the way through Christmas. Because Jesus says, now that you're ready and you're grateful and you're healed, now I can use you. And I think he'd say the exact same thing to us. One more thing before we take communion. As we think about this issue of gratitude, I want you to know the implication gratitude and thankfulness has on your worship. Colossians 3.16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. How's your worship? When I ask that, I'm not, of course, asking for the condition of your voice, how good and bad it is. I can't sing to save anything. I'm talking about what's happening in here or in here as you worship. And if it's off, it could be off for any number of reasons. It doesn't have to be this. But I would encourage you today to focus in on just this. As the, as the worship team comes up to lead us, as you sing, I want you just to think of all the stuff that you have that you're grateful for. And with that gratitude, once it's in here, sing with everything you got. We're going to take communion uh, at some point during the next several songs. You can come up when you are ready to do that. Uh, also known as the Eucharist. And we don't tend to call it the Eucharist anymore for, for a bunch of different reasons, but they used to. And the reason they used to call it the Eucharist is because they got it from Jesus' very words when he started this whole tradition of communion. When Jesus first broke that bread, and the Bible says he gave thanks, that word in Greek is eucharizo. And it literally means to give thanks. And what we did is we just transliterated that word, just a fancy term saying we monkeyed around with that word and we made it into our own word. And But what you're doing every single week is you are giving thanks for who Jesus is and what he did for us. Let's pray and then we'll take communion during the next few songs. God, we thank you because it all comes from you. Everything we have, everything that we are. And God, I pray you will use this week to develop gratefulness and thankfulness inside of us. I pray that we will literally spend time remembering all we have to be thankful for. And as we do that, we'll draw closer to you. We'll draw closer to each other. And we'll draw closer to being the type of people you want us to be. And as we remember what you've given us, we remember you did one significant thing for us all. You, Jesus, went to the cross for us. And so as we take the bread, we remember the body of Christ broken for us. As we take the cup of juice, we remember the blood of Christ poured out for us and for all. And I hope that just stirs in us an incredible thanksgiving and gratefulness that will carry us through Thanksgiving and beyond. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen.